Hello and welcome to In 20 with me, Roshan Arayan. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on your notifications if you're watching us on YouTube. And do follow us on our Facebook, Twitter, and our Instagram. All the highlights from our show will be played over there. And if you are right now watching us live, it's uh, a lot of fun to have Lo Wiwen on the show, a very good friend of mine who has been in the house for a very, very long time. And the question is, have you been working on I used to be working out until a month ago, then I just stopped because the ice cream looked fantastic, the rice looked fantastic, and I just gave up hope. Uh, well, I actually have still been working out. Um, sometimes it gets a bit mundane, but uh, we do what we have to do, you know? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a question. Like, you're a professional. I was a professional athlete in my past life, not in this one. Was it easy to stay fit? Is it easy to get back into the routine? I, I, I believe that you guys have been allowed to get back onto the court, correct? Officially, yeah, we just got uh, we just got the green light basically two days ago, I think, on the 15th. So it's our third day back on court now. Yeah, so it's been um, tough to say the least not being able to play squash, especially when you're healthy and you yeah. can compete, but um, being forced out uh, just doing some exercises on your own and then we only finally got to uh, to run outside and do some stuff outside but before that everything was indoors although I do play squash indoors I have to say but being confined in the house is slightly different <laughs> did you break did you break any material you know furniture any glass when you're playing the squash indoors um yeah I was close to actually trying to play some squash in my house but I think there's to be too much cleaning up to do on the walls <laughs> after so. <laughs> I mean, so what is, what's the protocols like now since you, uh, you're allowed on, onto the court? Are you allowed to play with uh, your coach, with your there's a training partner? Or what are the rules? Not at the moment, no. I mean, we have so many SOPs that I've heard this word SOP, I don't know how many times now, but the past two, two or three months. But I mean, it's, it's changing every day. Um, for now, we are just allowed to be one person on court. Um, huh? you, can't sit on, you can't sit on the bench. You can't wipe your hand on the wall. I mean, that's... It's but that's squash. It is, I mean, uh, I'm not. A, I'm not a master of squash, but I've always seen the likes of you yeah. and just you know wiping your hand dry. So wait, you're just there by yourself and you're just smacking the wall. Is it the ball? That's yeah, basically you're just hitting the ball back to yourself. And it's. I mean, it's good to actually get back on court, but um, for not being back on court for the last three months. But then again, you can't hit with anyone just because they want to avoid contact. Um, yeah, that's a pro you probably can't touch the same squash ball. So I mean. <laughs> Okay, you know, I'm not going to get into trouble by asking you all these <laughs> SOPs and uh, if you're following it. But, but, but answer this question, true or false? And if it's true, maybe you can give a you know, more in-depth answer. Is it true at one point in time during, during your playing career, you decided just to go get your legs checked and then after the X-ray or MRI was done, uh, you found out that your ACL was literally hanging by a thread, just a fiber, it was non-existent. True or false? Um, I would say true, but then again, the <laughs> funny thing was, it wasn't even hanging by a thread, it just disappeared. There was nothing left. <laughs> Wait, what? Your AC you didn't have an ACL? Well, I tore it the first time. I had it before. I was born with it, I think. Yeah. And then I tore it the first time, had a surgery, did the full surgery, the full work, spent nine months out of court, went yeah. back for a routine MRI, and there was nothing left in there. So... <laughs> There was nothing left. I, I, my, I'm looking at my producer and my friend here, Rashid, and he's like looking at me and like, I'm looking at you. What, what do you mean? How did you walk? The ACL is like one of the most important things on your in your body. How I didn't just walk. I was still playing squash. <laughs> okay. I, mean, I, I, knew, I, I yeah. knew that my knee will never feel the same way it was prior to the surgery, but I didn't know how I was supposed to feel with or without an ACL. So... I mean, I'm looking at the picture right now, and I tell you, that looks horrific. Uh, we were. What was going through your mind? Not when you first saw that, you know, when you first saw your leg, but after the surgery, what was going through your mind? Yeah, you know, after surgery, when you wake up, like you're still drowsy from all the medication and and from from just basically waking up. And then what happened was, uh, you don't feel much pain yet because you're still on painkillers. And yeah. then what happened was the surgeon actually came and have a look at, 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 at me after the surgery. And so they, he wanted to check the wound. So when he actually took out the bandages, the nurse took it out. He saw my knee. I saw my knee. And the first <laughs> thing he said to me was, 
wow, that looks pretty good. And I just looked at him thinking like, um, are you blind or <laughs> how does that look good in any way? You know? <laughs> So that, that, that picture we just showed you, according to him, it looked good. I mean, he's a doctor, so he should know. But my goodness, that, I don't that, think that, what, yeah. that's I'm like not sure a, what else he's seen before, but that, that that's like a, a picture, a still from the movie Mad Max. It's like stitches and plasters and everything. Oh my god. I mean, I hope nobody's vomiting or losing their dinner right now. If you're watching this on repeat, then you know. So okay, you know, this is the, the funny part, and you know, we are friends, and that's why we are joking about it, but <laughs> There's a lot of things going on right now in the world of football, at least, where all these big name superstars are coming out and talking about, you know, mental health, the depression they were going through, even in their prime. So for me, if I was to look at that picture again, what was going through your mind? Was it like, you know, were you panicking? Would you ever play again? How were you going to uh, fend for yourself? How were you going to feed yourself? Was all these things running through your mind? Yeah, of course. I mean, um, for any professional athlete, when you're out injured physically, that's one thing. But mentally, emotionally, and also financially, it's a it's a huge part. You know, there's so many factors that goes into it. Like I was out for what twenty over months. Like, how do you survive if you don't have if you can't make money and you can't play tournaments? There's no prize money, and obviously, you tend to lose some sponsors as well. You can't blame them. It's business. You know, you can't expect a sponsor to continue paying you when you're sitting down at home trying to recover, trying to learn how to walk again. You know. So, so was yeah. there any, was there any assistance uh, from the any sports governing body, or were you just on your own? Um, the good thing is I still had some of my basic allowance um, for basically my yeah just my basic salary, my allowance, but I had no prize money. Um, I had I lost some sponsors, but I also was very fortunate that two of my sponsors actually stayed with me and continued paying me even when I couldn't play any uh, squash at all, which I'm very thankful for, which is Nas Metro and also Mizuno. So they stood yeah. by me knowing that I will come back. And it's people like this that actually um, make me want to come back again. You know, They've, their support has been, um, yeah, has been tremendous. So, uh, Apart from that, was I mean, who was maybe a, a member of your family, your, your close friend, maybe uh, Nicole or your coach? Who was there for you, you know, just mentally, uh, you know, guiding you and just giving you that little, you know, just a little tap on your shoulder and say, you know, you can do this, you know, get back on your feet. Yeah, I mean, the good thing is that uh, I have a good team with me. I have a, my coach, obviously, my, my mom, my sister, although she's in the U.S. Um, she's practically useless in being in the U.S., not, not helping me <laughs> do anything. <laughs> 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 Jokes is right. I mean, she can't help me. She's, she's too far away. But other than that, I mean, just, you know, having people that will support you. I, I have my physio, my coach, my mom, um, friends and family, and also, like, like you say, just the fans and sponsors who actually believe that I can actually come back and and do this again and not just come back and play for fun and still, you know, still fight for it and still be uh, national number number one right now. You know, and, and at, at your fittest, uh, and when you were really informed, you uh, went up all the way to number five in the world. That was, I think, in 2014 or 2015. Yeah, I mean, this, this, theory, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this horrible, you had three surgeries, right? Yes, in total. Well, and then you've you've come back now. You're 25, I think, or I might be world, wrong. Yes. Yeah, I'm 25 in the world. Right now. You know what's the saddest part? If if you were like in our neck of the woods, they'd be going, oh, "Yeah, only five. Oh, yeah, only 25." And you're like thinking to yourself, "Oh my goodness, you're an elite athlete, one of the best in the world." And you mentioned you had all this support, but the one thing a lot of people might not know is the fact that at times the sport of squash is not exactly the most financially rewarding. Yes. Yes. Definitely. I mean, compared to any other record sports, uh, I don't know about table tennis, but they could be actually probably higher price money than air squash as well. But co comparatively oh to badminton, and we don't even go to tennis because tennis is a whole different ball game. But even talking about badminton, I don't think um, we earn half of what they do in, in terms of price money. And also what? partly because they're an Olympic sport, so the support that they get is a lot higher than what we do in squash. But but is that important? Because I know you were you Nicole and the rest of the the world uh, from the squash community were trying to push to get it. Uh, was it in the Rio Games or was it for what, what was it? There was a you were going for the, one of the Olympics, correct? To get it, one of uh, yes. the, yeah, anything. I mean, we've been trying for I don't know how many years now. It's been more than eight years for sure. So it has been more than two cycles that been trying to get in. Even for twenty twenty, we 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 couldn't even get in even for a trial sport. So. It has been mm -hmm. ongoing for a long time. But what, why, why do you think that is? Because it's actually a big sport, squash. 
It is, and I think we play in iconic venues. We've I've uh, I've played in the pyramids of Egypt. We played in the Grand Central Station in New York. I mean, we have all these iconic places. We we played in shopping malls in in Malaysia, even the Malaysian Open and everything like that. But it's um, well, it's tough to say. I mean, we've been trying so hard that it comes to a point where I guess we just um, I wouldn't say we're not bothered about it, but all we have is the Commonwealth and the Asian Games, and that's all we can look forward to. And then you, of course, have your individual tournaments. You know, you've got your prize money. You're coming back from this massive uh, setback. In terms of moving forward uh, for yourself as well, what do you think that perhaps we need to do better here in our neck of the woods to help the next generation, you know, achieve these goals? Um, first of all, for players to actually want to turn professional, squash has to be, like it or not, it has to have uh, some financial backing, it has to be lucrative, and it has to be able to be seen as a career. You can't just play squash for the love of the sport and still end up not having a car, not having a house, can't, you can't pay your bills. As much as we love the sport, we do it for a living, we still need to at, at least make a decent living to support, you know. Um, so I think financially, a lot of people do not see that squash is a viable option. And yeah. that's probably a reason why we have a good group of juniors, but only a very small handful that turn professionals. A lot of them, uh, I'm not saying it's wrong, but a lot of people um, use squash as a stepping stone to get to the U.S. Because the mm. uh, U.S. offer a lot of good scholarships to squash players. So a lot of Malaysians have actually gone to the U.S. Instead of turning professional, they have gone to the U.S. to, to further their education, which is a good thing. I mean, it's not often you get many Malaysians going to Harvard, Princeton, Trinity, you know, that sort of colleges in the US. So I think it's it's a good thing, but it's end of the day, yeah. It's so you, all, yeah. you just mentioned you can get into Harvard with squash, but yes. you can't get into the Olympics. I'm sorry, yes. I mean I know the Olympics is huge, but I mean you ask you mentioned the word Harvard to anybody and, and they, they they find squash that important then. Yes. We have, we have squash players from Malaysia who's gotten to Harvard on a full scholarship just to play squash and represent Harvard. You know, it's squash is a big thing in the US, and they were they actually looking at Malaysians because um, we actually speak uh, good English and we have a good uh, work ethic that sort of thing. So a lot of colleges actually look at Malaysians, and they actually fight for us to go to the US. I was offered scholarships when I was seventeen to go to the US instead of playing professional squash. So I had to decide at that point in time whether do I want to play professional squash and make a career, or do I want to go off and study. My sister went off to study, so she took the other path, but. It's a, it's a big decision to make, you know. Do you, sorry, as a friend, I have to ask you this question. Do you regret it? Um, well, the funny part is actually, I never thought I'd get injured, so I never think that I'll be out for such a long period of time. Mm. But um, what I, what uh, spoke to me was that, to me, my rationale was I can always go back to education at the age of 35 if I want to. I can yeah. still probably get a degree at 40 years old if, if, I, if I'm really that desperate, you know. But to me, sports, you need to have X amount of years. I can't yeah. go back and play professional squash at the age of 45, you know. So to me, that was my rationale. But imagine me trying to convince my mom to come meet me and we live in a Chinese-Asian culture where like, no, nah, I'm, I'm good. I don't need to study. I'm just going to go and play some squash, you know. <laughs> You know, I have an, a degree in IT. I don't even know how I got a first class honors, but now I'm sitting in front of a mic, you know, talking to you. I mean, it's weird how our life pans out. But in terms of panning out, you set yourself three goals, correct, for your comeback? Yes, yeah. Uh, could yeah, you share what those three of them were? Um, for my comeback, eventually, my goal is still to make the top 10 of the world. Um, I've been there before. I know how hard it is to get there. But to be able to get there again, it's... it's uh, it's good validation for me knowing that I can still match the top goals. Mm -hmm. And another thing is also the one of my goals is to win the Asian Games. Uh, uh, individual gold medal. I've won the silver. I've lost in the call, I think, in the Asian Games, the previous mm -hmm. Asian Games. Yeah, and we won a team event together before, but that's one of my goals still is to win the Asian Games. Yeah. So you lost to Nicole David, who was the world number one for about eight years, which is ridiculous in any sport. And I don't think she gets enough credit or, you know, recognition for what she's done for just not, not the world of squash, but as a, a, a female athlete as well. That is ridiculous, right? Eight years as world number one. That is. And, and because of that, I'm number five and no one cares. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I care. We want your family cares. I, I promise you. No, no, that's the, I mean, no, it's, it's true. 
But to get to number five, you said it takes a lot of sacrifice. You're aiming to get there. But once you are done with the game, would you ever go into coaching and guide the next generation? Um, I mean, I would want to. I would want to actually give back to a sport that has given me so much. I mean, squash, I grew up with it. Uh, it was It's basically my whole life. Um, as you know, I think we spoke about this before. Uh, I started squash at age of nine when my parents got divorced. And that's basically what saved me and it made me who I am today. Um, just all the values that come with it. It's not just about playing squash. It's just, it's about the people, the values you learn growing up and, and all these values you carry on, not just as athletes, but in whatever you want to do in life later on. So, I mean, I do want to have that and try and inspire the younger generations. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be coaching. I mean, I do love the sport and I probably would do some coaching. But then again, I don't want it to be my to rely on it to be my only source of income where I'm forced to do it, then it becomes yeah. a different sort of field. It's not, you're not doing it out of passion and you're doing it out of, out of for a paycheck, you know, it, it's two mm. different things. So, yeah. You mentioned something which I don't think a lot of athletes, I mean, not even athletes, a lot of celebrities don't come out that, you know, openly and just say, I, 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 my parents were divorced at a very young age. Did that inspire you to be a better athlete, to be a better person? Uh, well, actually, I think um, every negative has some positive to it. Like even my surgeries, for example, like I was out for such a long period of time, but you actually know your support system. You actually know what can, um, it makes you stronger. Like I would say, it teaches you all the values, how to appreciate more gratitude. And it just, you just see life as a different perspective, you know, and yeah. you, and you just learn that nothing's perfect. You just work with what you, what you're given and make the best out of it. You mentioned also something like if there was a young Asian parent, or slightly older, who has a kid that's a lot of potential, just not in the world of squash, but in sports, would you tell them to let their child pursue their dream? That's a, that's a tough question because um, <laughs> most, I would say um, I think we are actually getting better in a sense where the parents are not pushing so much on education where it used to uh, compared to where it was before. Um, but then again, I think the key rely, uh, lies on the kid itself. What do they want? Because end of the day, you can tell them what to do. You can push them into your dream or their dream. But if they don't want it themselves, it's never going to happen. You can try mm. all you want, but if they don't want it themselves, it's it's just not going to work. You know. You so don't force them into a particular line, whatever it may yeah. be. Just because, as a parent, you might think, "Oh, there's some money down there on that little venture of theirs." Yeah, I mean, everybody growing up wants to be a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher. No, not me. I didn't. I didn't want to be. I wanted to be a pilot. Then I wanted to join the WWE as a wrestler. Uh, then oh, I wanted I to be a, a. No, what happened to that? I just sat on my couch and I watched them wrestle. I didn't do anything. No, but but it's it's a good point. It's it's a decision that needs to be made and just guide the kid correct and make sure that they follow their dreams. Yeah, because. Um, everything has to come from within. It's the determination, the persistence. I could easily, if I didn't want to make squash a career after my first surgery, I could easily walk away. You know, even my mom said to me, like, you've gotten to five in the world. You can, you don't have to go through the surgery and you've achieved enough. You know, you've done well enough for yourself. You can just do whatever else you want in life. But that determination, that uh, persistence that I had was that I still have goals that I want to achieve and there are still people who still believe in me and I, and that was the reason why I decided to go through with all the surgeries and to still come back and play squash although technically I think I could have done something else if I wanted to. That's a very powerful statement and thank you so much uh, Weewen for joining us. Any last words to any of your, your fans out there? Uh, where can they catch you next? Um... Good question. I don't know where I'll be. <laughs> um, I'll probably be stuck at home for, for another long while. Uh, something that I'm not very used to because we're used to traveling in and out. I mean, sometimes I come home for a few days and I'm off to a different country. So right now, we're all in limbo. We have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, not just in the squash world. I mean, for you guys as well. We just don't know what's going to happen, whether we can travel. And if we're traveling for a tournament, for example, how, how, how is that going to work with the quarantine and everything else? So it's every country has their, their own set of rules as well. So to be honest, we're all, uh, we're all stuck in the limbo. We don't know what's going to happen. So Yeah, it's yeah. called SOPs. Thank you very much, uh, Weewen, for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. We'll catch up soon, and I hope you come back on the show as well. Will do. Nice. It's big to you again. 
Likewise, remember, do follow us on our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter page, and turn on the subscriptions on our YouTube channel. Till the next time, bye-bye.